Welcome to Property Insights again, and I'm here today with uh, Scott O'Neill, and he is the Managing Director of Rethink Investing. Now, just a quick uh, uh, bio on him. Uh, Rethink Investing is a BRW, Fast 100 company in 2017-18, and Australia's largest and most experienced buyer's agency. That's it, buyer's agency. For commercial property investors, Rethink Investing has helped over 3,500 clients purchase over this is a big number three billion in real estate since 2015 scott and Earl, welcome mate thank you mate and uh how are you going yeah not bad how are you going in this uh increased interest rate marketplace where commercial property is so sensitive to yields um how's things going there well if you asked me 12 months ago what I would have thought would happen if rates went up 3%, I would have been probably freaking out as a business owner going, all right, well, clients are going to drop off a lot. Um, in fact, we've remained steady in terms of the client demand. And one of the reasons for that is I think a lot more people are jumping ship from residential. So these are direct purchases, commercial property. So remember, this is not fund management. This is someone going out to buy a one, two, three, four million dollar commercial property by themselves. So. The cash flow in that asset class is still better than anything else out there because you're looking at six, seven, eight percent net. So interest rates are around five and a half to six and a half percent right now, net for commercial loans, and it's still positively geared if you're buying the right asset. So interestingly, I, the demand sort of it's it's remained constant, but there's sort of I guess there's different types of clients. It's more your business owners. A few of the mums and dads have dropped off, so it's just a mixed bag really. But um, it's nowhere near as bad as I thought. The, the the guys are still there trying to buy. Yeah, so just just I think we should just have a look at you. A, you're a buyer's agency. You actually go out and find property for a buyer. That's that's an important distinction. Um, and as a buyer's agent, you've been doing this for a long time. Um, what's the difference today in terms of demand as a buyer's agent compared to say, I don't know, 2015 when you guys kicked off? What's the difference? What are you seeing the difference? Uh, well. <laughs> The, the f more time that goes on, the more, uh, I guess, educated the buyers seem. So back then, um, no one wanted a buyer of commercial property. It was all residential, you know, just ride the growth train. Uh, meanwhile, commercial was getting the same level of growth, believe it or not. It's just one of those old myths that it doesn't grow as quick, but it does. And uh, I found that, um, yeah, more people are kind of struggling with the lower yields of residential before. So they're already open to a different asset class. So we've been naturally organically growing just due to the wider market growing with it, there's just more people open to commercial property. So that's probably the biggest difference I've found now. And when you say commercial property, now what are we talking about? We're talking about retail shops, we're talking about um, what you what you specialise, or where the demand is. Is it in office space, strata office floors, or we talk, or I know, I mean, I know industrials like on fire, yep. but hard to get. Um, where, are you, where are you guys specialising in? So we're probably more your industrial, essential retail, uh, we do a bit of childcare specialty stuff. Um, medical assets are the big ones. Office space is the kind of ugly duckling at the moment, especially CBD office space. So we're finding, um, yeah, like you said, industrial is just red hot. Uh, in rental growth out of it, the, the capital growth as well is is really full on at the moment. And uh, they're byproducts of kind of that post-COVID world, you know, people moving online, selling stuff, manufacturing it in, in sheds. And uh, yeah, the demand's um, definitely in those asset classes. And that's probably one of the good things about commercial property. You can, it's like stocks, you can always pick a different sector, which is performing at a different space. So uh, we sort of try to pick the sectors that are doing better. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting, um, industrial, it sort of makes sense to me, like, I mean, I'm, I'm from Sydney, but if I'm just looking at Sydney, for example, um, and let's say um, I live and all my staff live in, I don't know, uh, somewhere west of Sydney, they all live around Glebe and Camperdown and Anadar, and whatever. And um, and let's say um, we're manuf manufacturing something, and or we need industrial space. In other words, warehouse stuff. We don't really want to have to travel out to Campbelltown if possible. So mm. straight away, I'm looking at well, where's an industrial area close to where I am. And let's say I go to what was Alexandria. Um, and Alexandria was full of warehouse space uh, one, once upon a time. And, uh, but then it also makes sense that that warehouse space, because of its proximity to the city, become res rezoned as residential. So two things happen. The warehouse space that I may have owned 
becomes rezoned and all of a sudden I can put 30 stories up there, I sell that to um, you know, Meriton and I make a lot of money out of it. Or the other thing that happens is as a result of me selling, there's a lot less warehouse space. And all of a sudden all the warehouse space there can demand really high rental returns if it stays as a warehouse. Yeah. That's assuming maybe it was that particular area wasn't part of, you know, that Alexander area was not rezoned, it was just kept as industrial. All of a sudden that becomes really valuable because now there's a shortage, a scarcity of warehouse space. That's happening in all the big cities. As the cities expand, more and more people want to live there. Stuff close to the where everything's going on uh, needs to be rezoned so you can put towers there. And only one thing that happened is you get a rarity or a scarcity, I should say, probably is a better way of t- describing of, of industrial space. Is that what you're experienced yeah, over the last 10 years? It's a classic supply-demand ratio. And that's why there's been better growth for this type of stuff than residential and, and other asset classes because industrial property is not popular to, from a zoning point of view. You don't really, councils don't want to go out there and make more of it. So especially that inner city stuff, it's just, it's just going to get absorbed and you know, it might be worth more as a high rise. Uh, I think you're going to start seeing uh, multi-story industrial properties in the future. They, they do that in Japan and places oh, really? like yeah. that. So, That's interesting, like multi-story warehouses, so to speak. Yeah, and it's like not viable at the moment because you've got very high, um, you need massive weighted floor loads uh, and that kind of stuff. So huge amounts of concrete cost a lot of more money, so it's probably cheaper to go you know, an hour out of the city to build it at this stage on one level, but that will change in time. So that will actually increase the yield on the property in these areas. And it's all just going to increase rents and rents, as you know, in commercial property is how you value I mean, like a large portion of it. So if you can increase the rents on the property and that will come through tightening of supply demand ratios, um, more floor space, it's just, it's a good picture. It's a good outlook for it. Could you just explain something to me like, um, and I think this is important to understand if you're an investor and you're thinking about investing in commercial property, and it doesn't really matter whether it's office space, industrial space, retail, whatever, you, what are you thinking about? The value of a commercial property is has a little bit of emotion attached to it, but it's largely related to, let's call it the yield on the property. It's a little bit more binary in that um, if this bit of commercial space is delivering this rent, then you, the buyer, and also the vendor's agent knows that that rent is usually multiplied by a thing called um, the cap rate that gives you the value. That's right. So it's that, the value is the value. It's sort of, yep. so there's, there's not too much room for error. So expl- can you explain how cap rates are derived? In other words, the thing you multiply the rent or the, the net rent by so in other words, the rent might be a million bucks a year, you're paying $400,000, for argument's sake, in land taxes and outgoings. So, so in other words, the net rent 600 grand a year. And let's say it's a, a pick a retail space in a certain area, you multiply that, retail, that by a, a number, that 600 grand by a number, and that gives you the value. Can you explain how that works? Yeah, so to answer your question, Mark, it's, there's a little bit of an art to working out the capitalization rate, the cap rate. So. Cap rates are normally a function of risk or perceived risk, uh, and that can be to the local market or the wider market. So if you've got, uh, you know, if, if you're buying in multiple cities, you might see a certain city as being a better uh, risk than it should be, and then you can price it in. So using the numbers you used, if you've got a 6% cap rate and there's a 600 grand rent, you divide it by 0.06, so 6%. So that would value that property at $10 million. So if you can increase that rent by, you know, let's say you doubled the rent on it, it's now 1.2 mil, now that asset is worth 20 million. Because you still multiply it by the same number. Correct. The multiply doesn't change, no. the rent has to change. Exactly. Yeah, to get a higher price. And there's a lot that goes into that cap rate. So obviously age of property, it lowers the risk, you know, more depreciation benefits, longer leases, people will be prepared to pay more for rent. Um, so like one one thing that happened over the last decade is yield compression. So back in What's Sydney, that mean? so everything was sort of selling at 6% cap five rate. years, 6% cap rate. So basically what that means, you, the, the, based on the risk associated with a particular asset class, yep. you know, it could, might be retail and wherever, retail commercial premises, retail and office space in a particular area, um, the risk associated with buying in that particular area you, the agents and the valuers in the market, deems it to be needs to have a return of six percent per annum for me to just be justified for paying 
for that property. Correct. That's what I need to pay. Yep. I ne- it needs to give me 6% per annum return. Yep. So a $600,000 return means I have to, I should be paying $10 million. So, or yep. another way of looking, if I pay $10 million for a, that type of property in that particular area, given the risk, I should be getting 600 grand net back a year. That's right. Who determines that? Six percent. Like, who's the dude who sits this around making these calls? Yeah. Oh, well, it's the market. So, hundreds of comparable sales are what derives that cap rate. And over that ten-year period in Sydney, uh, everyone all of a sudden said, "All right, I'm going to pay ten million dollars for only four hundred thousand of rent." So the cap rate turned to four. Why did that happen? That that's interesting because I, I have I have experienced that. So, the cap rate. Uh, change to i don't know what whatever first four percent whatever it is if, yep. to four percent so it went down is it because interest rates are like one percent in the bank and relative to what i can get in the bank which is a risk-free return effectively risk-free yep um i should only have to pay four percent or demand four percent return on that particular property is that how it works that's how a lot of it happened also just more people entering the market so right. i think this is a long-term trend so in Australia, there's about 550,000 residential sales per year. In commercial, it's about 20. So imagine if there are an extra 100,000 people come from residential a year to fight over that little 20,000 pool. Like It's just more demand. So it will get squeezed. That's one of my predictions. There's just going to be more people playing so in that space. squeezing does what to the cap rate? Uh, it's, it makes it go lower. So people are paying more for the same level of rent. Right. So the price goes up for the same amount of rent. So... In Sydney, you know, people were paying ten million now for four hundred thousand of rent. Now that interest rates have gone up, you know, like you mentioned, you can get risk-free money in the bank. They're like, well, I'm not going to pay six percent now. I might pay five percent. So I need five hundred grand of rent to justify that. Or what someone like my business does goes, well, we don't want a five percent in Sydney. That doesn't warrant uh, the risk or the the reward. We're going to go into Brisbane and get a seven, or go to Perth and get a seven percent, or go to I don't know, Adelaide and Which get a seven point five. Yep. For for the same for seven percent return, you pay you're paying you it means you pay less money for that particular asset. So vendors or owners could be losing money. Like if I bought it when it was a four percent, um, when it, if I paid um four percent, if I if I bought it paid ten million dollars and I got four hundred grand return two years ago, three years ago, in the middle of COVID. Yep. May be the case now that if I want to sell it, your buyers might say, no, 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 it's, it's a bit risky now and I can get risk-free money in the bank at 5% return. Yep. Um, I'm only going to, I really, I'm only going to pay you $8 million for that particular property because I, I, I just don't see it as, as valuable. I see it as more risky. It's not, it's probably more that, that's probably more the question, isn't it? It's not that it's not as valuable. I just see it as more risky. Yep. So I want a better return. I want more rent. Is, is that is are you finding that people are losing money because there has been some discussion about some of the big fund managers who own these massive buildings in the city office space because that's where it's being affected mostly yep. in office space you know it's just seemed to be much more risky and uh there's even discussions about revaluing some of these big funds who hold billions of dollars worth of office space in the city in sydney here for example maybe we should be getting revaluations done because there's not the rental market there anymore yeah well the, that's a really interesting point so what you mentioned is correct, but the one bit of the equation that's missing is the rental growth. So, like, for example, we'll keep talking about Sydney. Like, rents have gone up 50% since COVID. So, there's actually more rent coming in per square meter on the asset value. There's also building costs have gone up about 50%. So, yeah. this is another valuation method, like replacement value. Right. Now, you can't replace this stuff at the same value as you once did. So, yeah. in time, that's going to filter through into the market because builders and developers, and you're seeing all them getting crunched at the moment the supply is just going to be a big problem over the next five years. We're not building enough of anything in Australia. So the remaining assets on the ground built are just going to get fought over more. And where you see it first is always the rental market. And then that flows in because yields grow, investors chase the yields, and then they push prices up. It all flows into it. But uh, again, where the rental growth isn't being seen is those office markets because there's just too much supply. Like vacancy rates are still over... 10 12 percent so that means one out of 10 buildings if you fill all the others up completely in the sydney there's a big vacant building one of them every 10 is totally vacant so that's terrible for rental growth because tenants have selection in that market in tightly held retail markets or medical spaces or uh, industrial there's simply not that 
available space around. So they have to fight, and that's where the rent growth comes from. So should would you say to a, a buyer of commercial property that they should be looking to buy the stuff that where there's you know smaller rental growth because there's a lot of it available, or would you say to them go and buy where you're sure to make money because um, the demand, for example, industrial, the demand is just going to outstrip supply and therefore it's a sort of no risk situation, if you know what I mean. No, it's no, no such thing as no risk situation, yeah. but it's less risky. What, what, I mean, would you encourage people to go and buy an office, a, a strata floor space in the middle of the city, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, um, which might not even be rented or you might have to rent it out at a, a sort of a cheap price to get the tenant in there. But over time, because you buy cheap, you make money over time. But where should they be looking? I'd always buy quality. And quality means it's in demand. Because remember, if you're buying like a really tightly held premium blue chip type asset, in 10 years time, the rent might be 60, 70% higher. Or even if it's only 40% higher, that means your value has gone up by that same percentage. I'd rather that than just chasing a discounted vacant property where you're going to have to find a tenant and then you've still got years of uncertainty over like rental growth it just doesn't make sense it is risky that's where like i actually think commercial investing is is not risky at all when you know what you're doing because you can target those tight markets there's a current tenant in place they may have been there a decade already it's a going concern sale you know what's happening if you start going into that scenario buying vacant office or yeah you might get a discount up front but um but then you're going to be battling for the next five years of uncertainty so yeah, so it's interesting. It's, it's not like residential real estate because you, you can't really improve, like commercial real estate office space, for example. It's hard to improve because you can't. You've got no control over the building unless you're buying the whole building. But even then, you're not going to pull it down and rebuild another place. Um, you can't put, you know, like you can residential. You can't put a beautiful kitchen in there or something like that, and uh, you know, you know, make it look unreal because it's not. It's an office. You can't really do it. So you're saying um, then you've got to. If you're making a decision about buying commercial property, make a decision based on where is the demand and where is the demand going to continue to be demand and where the supply is, is going to be undersupplied. And uh, so it doesn't really matter whether it's industrial or um, retail or whatever the case may be. It's about looking at the demand for the particular type of subclass of commercial property. Is that what we're talking about? Exactly. And that's what you guys do? Yeah, and so if, your business does, you find these things. Yeah, and if you can do that, you will outperform the market. It's like a good stockbroker analogy. You know, if you're regularly picking the winners, you are going to outperform the ASX. We're doing that on a, you know, quite a micro level. You know, you're buying tightly held inner city industrial or you might go into essential retail because we know the supermarkets of, you know, with the medical center and the childcare, all part of it, like those little mixes, those neighborhood shopping centers we love as well. They're not going anywhere, you know, and they've probably been there for 50 plus years in that one site. Zonings are very restrictive in many places as well. So they don't make more of this space often. Um, if you go out to new urban sprawl locations and you buy new business, that's where the risk might be higher, but then your yield might be better. So you've got to weigh up, do I do that or do I stick to the inner city stuff? Um, strong regional locations are, are going great um, and they're just established uh, sites as well. So, yeah, if you can get into that stuff, it's, um, it's good yield, good growth and, uh, and you just diversify within the different sectors as well. And, and how are you finding helping your clients, for example, um, buy property, commercial property, but how are you finding their ability to borrow how, how are lenders looking at the, these particular borrowers are, are they a scrutinizing of the borrowers as they would be if they're buying a residential property i mean do they say give us a look at your your um uh, you know your expenses every month I mean, or is it just a little bit not loose but a little easier well this is why i switched to commercial initially so i, I bought about oh, 18 19 residential properties before getting into commercial the bank said no more they said you've, you've got too much debt you've outstripped your serviceability so I was like, I had equity, you know, and I was like, oh, I still want to keep buying. You know, I know this property stuff works. Uh, and then someone said, oh, I look into commercial. The yields were just literally three times better on a net basis. So we're looking at six, 7% net. As you know, residential, you Two or three. Yeah, if you're lucky these days. So you got more income straight away. That helps the serviceability calculator. 
I believe residential, you work off 3% buffer rates. Mm -hmm. uh, commercial's 1%. But then the holy grail of commercial is you've got this thing called a lease stock loan. So a lease stock means you can get a loan on the lease of the property without showing your financials. So it's almost like a super fun loan. You know, it's on the side. It doesn't look at the rest of your portfolio. So it's not you, worry about your serviceability, your serviceability. It's interested in the serviceability that comes from the property that you're buying. Correct. And uh, normally the rule is you, all it's right now, it's 1.5 times interest rate cover. So if you can hit that, away you go. So if the interest rate that you have to, if the interest calculation of what you've got to pay back every month, and a lot of times they don't require uh, principal in the early stages, is say 100 grand a year. Yep. So let's call it a $2 million loan, 5% interest rate, 100 grand a year. They expect to see 1.5 times that 150 grand a year yep. lease payments, at least rental. That's right. So if you can show, by the way, we're not suggesting this is the answer to credit applications, but as a rule, um, you should be looking at $150,000 worth of rent on a nice, good quality lease with a good quality tenant to service a $100,000 borrowing or well, the interest on a hundred thousand dollar borrowing because you're going to have to put some equity in generally speaking i think it's fair to say in commercial you put you have to you can't borrow as much though you can't borrow 90 percent or 80 percent no. you got to borrow what's your experience of that oh right now it's about 70 percent loans yep. um but as you go into the higher price points you're looking at 60 65 percent debt yeah so you know I, I personally run at 50 percent debt on my portfolio and and everything's a pretty good picture then, even if interest rates went up to 9%. If you're sitting at a lower debt level, everything looks pretty good. So this is um, this is why a lot of investors in commercial keep going because they do have higher cash deposits, but then you've got higher income from the property. And the result is it's just a whole lot less distress selling. Like, And that's probably why there's, there is more pain in the residential markets um, because you've got those 90, 95% yeah. loan first time buyers big, big okay. borrowers yeah i mean and, and by the way been encouraged to do so by the reserve bank governor <laughs> um so there is a so i think basically what your business you know, rethink investing is doing is building a case or rethink your investment uh, strategy build a case for and you guys have probably helped them do this but build a case for commercial buying buying commercial as part of your portfolio and not just limiting yourself to residential because by the way that there's risk associated with not doing something and uh, you're suggesting at least rethink your strategy and perhaps look at um, including some commercial in there I into your portfolio for all the reasons you just said. Um, it's interesting, um, that borrowing piece and, and the fact that you can take equity out of another portfolio and stick it in there as part of your equity for your commercial acqu acquisition um, makes a lot of sense to me. And it's, it's, it is at the end of the day about how well can I leverage because I mean, buying property is all about leverage. Yep. Leveraging the bank's money for a return that either equals what I got to pay the bank back, so I'm equal, even, or alternatively, even doing better than that, getting an increase in what my re yield or my return relative to what I got to pay the bank. I think that um, commercial, I mean, I'm a big believer in commercial property, um, not so much industrial, I've never really gone into that territory, but uh, nor office space, so I have been down the office space territory, but sort of retail and, uh, you know, uh, hotels and stuff like that. I like quite like a lot. And I mean, I mean, accommodation, mm -hmm. travel accommodation. Uh, big shortage of that in New South Wales at the moment. Massive shortage because it all got converted during COVID into a residential. And uh, now there's a sh now all these immigrants are coming. People are coming on holidays. They got nowhere to stay. It's crazy. And they don't want to stay the four seasons in the middle of the city. Yep. They want to stay other places. And uh, the world that you operate in, Scott, is uh, quite an exciting world. I think. Um, I totally underdone. In, in Australia and being a buyer's agent I think is more important in what you do being a buyer's agent in a commercial uh, property is probably more viable than being a buyer's agent in residential property because people sort of got a bit of an idea what to do about residential buyers commercial a they've got no idea but there are some real um, tricks and techniques that you guys use to leverage the best outcome You've, I, I just noted early when I read it, you got three and a half thousand, you've helped three and a half thousand clients buy. That tell, tells me that there is a lot of demand for your game. Yeah, look, and to put it in perspective, we, 
over the last three years have closed our doors um, three times for three months. So we've got too much demand from clients, um, six month waiting periods and stuff like that, especially in the lower price points. There's simply not enough properties up there. The one issue with my industry is it's just the lack of properties worth buying. You know, like I mentioned before, there's 550,000 transactions in residential a year. There's 20,000 in commercial and a lot of them are too low in yielding or they're vacant or they're, you know, 50 million plus dollar assets. So the pool of properties worth buying, it's tiny. Um, we've survived and got that number due to off-market transactions. So the great thing about commercial property is there is a lot more true off-market. You know how residential buyers agents say, oh, off-market sale here. It's been flogged around 10 different agencies. Can't sell. Yep, exactly. Or it's a, like, this is not how commercial goes because it is a much more secret world. Like sometimes they don't want the tenants knowing it's for sale. Sometimes it's a high net worth individual selling a property and he doesn't want everyone knowing he's got his for sale sign in front of his IGA complex. There's all that kind of secrecy and uh, agents, because they do less transactions, they are very protective of listings. So if they get one, they encourage to sell off market. So that's where we play. We, we really go 70 odd percent off market. Without that, um, yeah, you'd be flogging yourself on the uh, auctions and just overpaying for stuff, and and that's where it gets hard in this space. So that's that's our trick, the off market. Well, if you're looking to uh, diversify your portfolio or just dip your toe into the commercial environment, and that is buy into the commercial environment, you need to rethink your strategy. So Scott O'Neill from Rethink Investing, thanks very much, mate. Thanks, Mark.